Welcome folks to one of my favourite natural venues. This is a local venue for me. It's a beautiful reservoir. It's called Saddington Reservoir. This place is somewhere I've fished since I was a kid. I used to come up here, we'd catch roach, bream, there'd be some tension here. The specimen guys even target the big carp that are in here. And it, it's a fantastic place to come and fish. And a lot of my sort of natural feeder fishing is, is has revolved in my life around this venue. It's a beautiful place to come. Now, today is all about targeting bream, and I'm hoping I'm gonna catch some tench as well. There's a few tench be, being caught, there's a few feeding at the minute, and you know, when was the last time you actually went somewhere and caught a few tench in beautiful surroundings like this? This could be a really stunning day. So before we go on about all the kit and the setup, I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about why I've chosen this swim and whereabouts I'm going to fish because I think that's really important. So this is the shallower, shallower end of the lake and at this time of year when the water's warming up, fish are maybe thinking about spawning, I think that the shallow end of any reservoir is the place to go if I'm honest. So I've chosen this particular swim for those reasons. Now finding a spot out there to fish, in my opinion once this marginal growth starts happening, all these reeds start growing and the fish like I say, start thinking about spawning and getting in those areas. I don't really want to be casting too far, you know. I think those fish are hanging around the reeds, they're hanging around all that weed, and that's a natural place for them to be. So why would I want to cast to the moon? Today, I want to find it, well, I have found an area, I found an area at 35 metres, and I wouldn't want to really go much further than that. A lot of matches are being won at the minute on bream venues where anglers are casting a little bit shorter than everyone around them and making making the most of those fish that are at that short range. So to find that area, I had a quick chuck out with my sort of like baiting up stroke feature finding rod. It's a carp rod with 020 braid, big reel. And I just chucked out a two ounce bomb, gave it a bit of a drag around out there. And I'm really happy that I've got an area at 35 meters that, that I can fish on confidently. You know, there's not a load of weed out there. There's not a load of snags. I'm really happy. Now, to get my fishing rod to the same length as this this rod, because I'm gonna put in some bait with this rod, all I've done is got the measuring sticks out, wrapped it around the measuring sticks. I know I'm fishing exactly 35 meters. I can then put the fishing rod around those same measuring sticks, find the same spot. You know, Bob's your uncle, I'm fishing on exactly the same place where I'm gonna put my feed. Now, feed wise, in actual fact, I was halfway through putting some feed in, then I realized I need to show you guys what I'm doing. So, a big feeder, I'll show you that feeder. I've got a big feeder on, because I want to put in an initial amount of bait. I want to pull these fish. These fish could be miles away at the minute, and I want to pull these fish and create a bit of a better bait. It's only six foot deep out there, so if it was any deeper, I probably wouldn't put so much bait in, but I think it's important. So. Bait wise, this is my initial pre-bait sort of like Bombay mix. In this mix, we have our ground bait, which is Swimston Green. I don't think you can go anywhere where carp anglers are fishing and not use a fish meal based ground bait. We're targeting quality fish and Swimston Green, just simply open a bag of that. You know, it ticks all the boxes for me. Beautiful, nice, fine ground bait. We've kept that separate for fishing with. And into our pre-baiting. We've also added some, some pellets. We've got some two mil swim stim originals. They've gone into that pre-bait mix. Also, we've got some corn. Now, I've been using one of these choppers just to chop up some corn. You get these on eBay or Amazon or you know wherever you want to look on the internet. They cost, I don't know, around a tenner. And simply by giving it a, a bit of a whiz, got beautiful chopped corn so if I whiz that you can get really fine corn if you just want a few coarse bits in there you can just whiz it a few times just makes it a lot easier and you get really nice attractive bits and bobs and juices going in your swim so we put a few good handfuls of that in there and also some chopped worms I've got some dendrobenas with me today clear out some of that soil we've got some Nice big dendrobenas. I've chopped up a few of those. I've put that in that pre-bait mix as well. And we've got a few more there for chopping up later on in the session. Plus we've got our worms for hook bait in a bit of soil to keep them, keep them as comfortable as possible for as long as possible in that soil. The only other bait, and I don't really want to put any in on the pre-bait, so I haven't, 
that we've got with us is some dead reds. I don't think you can go anywhere on a natural venue without some dead reds. I think you're going to get a bite from most species, but also I just feel like you could run the risk of attracting a few smaller fish into the swim. So, like I say, I'm halfway through putting this pre-bait in. And what I'm going to do is I'll just put a couple in for you and then I think a couple more. We've put in eight or nine as it is. I was going to put in ten, but we'll put in like I say, a couple more and then we'll talk about the kit. So, it's so nice having a a dedicated rod set up for this sort of thing because we're chucking a big feeder i mean this isn't the biggest feeder that i would chuck and when we go right way and fishing world championship conditions you're allowed to chuck massive feeders so on a pre-bait period where you're putting in a lot of bait casting huge feeders you need a proper setup to do it and this is a three and a half pound test curve carp rod 020 braid it's a little bit overkill if I'm honest, but you just know that it's never going to let you down. So we're only shucking 35 meters today and it's you know it's ridiculously easy. So there's another couple in. There's what, 10 or 11 feeder falls of bait gone in. And I think that's enough of a of a bed to fish over. Just lay that down there. Right. Let's talk about the kit we're going to use today. We're only chucking short, so we'll start with the rod and the reel. This is an 11 footer. It's a free spirit, it's the highest power feeder, it's the special. If you can see that there, you're probably upside down on that screen there. But it's 11 foot, like I say. We're chucking 35 meters. I don't really see the need of using a longer rod. The, the only time that I would use a longer rod. You know, and, and I think it might come back to biters, is this marginal weed. It might be nice to get our fish over this marginal weed, but I think for how beautiful it is to play the fish on a, a nice, soft 11-foot rod, I'm going to take my chances, you know, because it's so nice playing the fish on, on this piece of kit. Line on the reel, we have got six-pound midi M-Tech, and then we've got a shock leader, and it's quite a long shock leader. It's seven metres, and... That is £12 midi M tech. So we're never going to have any issues with fish breaking our shot leader. And when we get it at the netting stage, we can really give it some power. Now, we've got a bomb on there at the minute. Obviously, when I was setting up, I just used the bomb. But you can see there, we've got our really simple running rig. Simply a snap link on the line. I've got two number eight slot shot. And those slot shot just act as the buffer above a four inch twisted boom. You know, the last thing I want to do is sit there with a tangle and that twisted boom helps massively with that. So a running rig, if I get any problems with the weed, hopefully the fish still stays connected and we might have a chance of pulling them through. Feeder wise, I'm going to start on a cage feeder. I've got some window feeders with me, but I think a cage feeder, especially as we're only fishing in six foot of water, I think a cage feeder is going to be perfect. So I love these rocket star feeders, I think they fly fantastically. You can also put your bait in there at how you want. You can put your bait in nice and soft, you can put your bait in really hard, and you know that your, your bait's getting to the bottom. I think a good starting point would be the, the five square, which is like a medium size, I guess. So I think that's going to be a good starting point. Simply clip him on to the link swivel. And we've got two different hook lengths with us today. And the, start, the one that we're going to start on is a standard... spade end hook. I'm going to start with two worms and see what happens with two worms. That's tied to 018. And I tie all my hook lengths up, maybe you can see that there, to a meter. And I think that's great. In some situations you want a, a longer hook length. But I'm going to start off at about 60 centimeters. I 
kind of envisage we're going to get lots of bites on the drop today. So I think 60 centimetres is a great starting, uh, starting hook length length for, for feeder fishing. So we'll just bite that down. The other hook length I have with me is some hair rigs. I think double corn, maybe later on in the session or if we need to avoid a few nuisance fish, double corn could be a really good bait or even a hair rig worm. So we've got some hair rigs all tied up just with uh, push stops on, ready to go. So we can quickly whip this hook length off and put one of these push stop hook lengths on. But I think as a starting point, we put two worms on and we have a cast out. I've still got some of that pre-baiting mix left, so that's what I'm going to cast out and that's what I'm going to put in the feeder to start with. So we're not going to be shy with the hook bait. I mean, the average size of fish that I think we're fishing for is five or six pound. If we catch some bream, they're going to be five and six pound. I mean, the tension here are a similar size, I guess. It's such a long time since I've had any amount of tench from a natural venue that I'm really looking forward to today. There we go, two worms. Just using one of those dead maggots just to tip it off. We're going to lob it out and let's see what happens. So while we're waiting for a bite, let's just talk about a few nice practices to get into when you feed a fishing. So whenever I'm expecting decent fish, I get the old uh, line marker out. Now we've measured up where we're going to cast, where we're casting anyway. So it's 35 meters. If I do get a big fish and it tears off and I have to unclip the line, then you know I can go around the measuring sticks, re-stick up at 35 meters, but. I do still mark the line on the reel because occasionally you can just sort of like, when the fish is coming back towards you, you can just flip the line back under the line clip where that mark is. You know, it's doubly ensuring I know where to cast it on my very next chalk. So I just like to mark the line just in front of the reel with one of these little line marker pens. And then I know exactly where I'm fishing. The other thing is, is the stopwatch. I just cast out probably 30 seconds ago. So we're 30 seconds behind schedule. But I always think it's nice, especially early on in the session, when you don't really know how the session is going to unfold, using a stopwatch just gives you a little bit more of a, a feeling for the day. So I can just get my casting sorted. I know that if I'm getting bites at, you know, every five or six minutes, it's pointless me leaving the feeder in for 10 minutes. And likewise, if every bite's coming at five or six minutes, it's pointless me casting every two minutes because I'm missing that bite time. You know, it's all about saving as much time and getting as much fishing time in the water and not wasting your time during the day. So I think stopwatch is really important. The other thing is just, you know, making sure that you're ready for your next cast. I see a lot of people, they just sit there, they just cast out and sit there. What I like to do is sort of like get my next cast ready. So into my bowl, because we're feeding a bit of liquidized corn, I'll just put a little blob of liquidized corn, flush my, flush fluff my ground bait through it a little bit and also because I want my ground bait to be a little bit damper I'll just add a little bit of water I always have a bit of water on my side tray and I'll just add a little bit of water to that ground bait and you can see there I've created a little blob in the middle of my mix that's ready for my next cast so as soon as I reel in I can bait up really quickly and cast that little blob of feed out again. Now we're on our, still using our bait up sort of mix, which is rich in particles at the minute. 
But you can see there that if that was in my standard mix, maybe later on in the session, we've got a lot more control adding our feed in that way because we're fishing each feeder full rather than spreading loose offerings all through the ground bait. And you know what it's like, you, you might be using casters and by the end of the day, they're all floating. And it's better to keep everything separate and add it as you go. And then you can tailor each feeder full for what you require. But I think we're nicely set. We've got two worms on and I think we're nicely set for a bite. It's landed perfectly. Seen the odd little fish top. I'm hoping we don't get pestered by little fish. I mean, it is the, definitely the bream and, and tench that we're after today. I'd be happy with a few skimmers, but I think a few big old warrior bream. Hopefully are on the cards. I like to set the tip so we're sort of fishing reasonably slack. We've still got a slight bend in the tip. What I don't want to see is a tip locked round. I think the fish are ever so wary of tight lines and I think a slacker tip is much better, especially with a running rig as well. Maybe with a helicopter rig, you might have to tighten the, the tip up a little bit more, but I think with a running rig, you can fish a lot slacker and I'm sure that fish are more happy to swim around your feeder and your hook bait when you've got a slack line in the swim. It's a beautiful day, the wind's absolutely perfect, nice warm wind. It's a beautiful setting, all we need now is a few fish. Whoa, <laughs> ladies and gents, it seems to take a while, but it is a really bright day. This feels like a reasonable fish. Probably been fishing for, I don't know, hour and a half, two hours now. But we did put a lot of bait in and the sun has got ever so high in the sky. There we go. And I just think the bright sun is maybe, it's maybe not helping us. But, oh, the fish are, <laughs> the fish are ever so warm. But, I'm sitting in the shade, so it's not, it's not overly nice sitting in the shade. There we go. First fish of the day. He's not a big old warrior. But he's, I'm guessing, maybe three pound. And hopefully, there's plenty more to come. We're we'll slipping straight back. We'll see if we can catch any more of his mates. We've had a few little skimmers and nothing really to write home about. But every fish and every indication has come on two little bits of worm, sort of scaled it down a little bit. So, two slightly smaller pieces of worm, hooked through the broken end. I've tried a grain of corn and nothing really happened, but like I say, we're not getting loads of indications anyway. So there's the the hook bait, two sort of inch long pieces of worm. We've also scaled down the feeder size. I, I just couldn't see the need to keep boshing in that, that big old, well, that medium feeder when we weren't catching anything. And I feel that there's enough bait out there already. We've put a lot of bait in, in that initial sort of like pre-baiting period. So I've scaled it down, little, four square rocket. It's a beautiful day, but probably not exactly perfect bream fishing conditions. But you know what? Sometimes it takes a while for the fish to turn up and hopefully that's the start of a golden little run.
Well, there's certainly so, some fish there now. I don't think, again, he's not a huge, huge fish, but much better than those little skimmers we've been catching. It's that bank of weed that, I don't know, it's probably about 20, 20 meters out that is giving me a bit of trouble, but we're through it now. Nice big hook on, so we shouldn't have too many problems with that. Trying to keep the rod as high up as possible. Right, I dread to think what it's going to be like if we do hook one of those big tench. But that, oh, it's beautiful in the sun, watching him come over the net. Cool. That is bream number two. Again, on that smaller feeder and just off camera, just in between those, uh, this fish and that first fish, I switched back to that bigger feeder. Nothing at all, couldn't catch a fish. Then we switched back again to that little, little tiny four square rocket feeder. Tiptoes round straight away. So it's not always a case of big feeder for big fish. Nice to see this is because it's probably three pound and you know what really good condition so a few years ago you tended to get just really like one year class of bream and there were five six pound fish and they were really old and you know it was just a little bit concerning because I just didn't know whether the future was safe for the bream in here but we've got a lot of skimmers sort of like six to eight ounce Obviously we're catching these fish that are three pound and they look to me, you know, reasonably young fish. You know, it's really good to see. So we're still fishing worm. I mean, that fish came on three, three little bits of worm. So I'm taking a big worm and chopping it into three little bits. So we get a little, blob of worm on the hook. We've got some liquidised corn and we're putting a few dead maggots in now. We've scaled everything back a little bit. That's, that's going in the feeder. Small feeder. And like I say, it's a little bit tougher than I expected if I'm honest, but at least we're starting to get a few now. I was maybe a little bit gung-ho early on in the session which has hindered us a little bit but yeah the fishing's good now we're getting bites most casts and we finally started catching some decent fish fingers crossed we we'll carry on catching Well, you know what, it's brilliant fishing now. Bites are so fast, some of them. We've made a couple of changes. Obviously, we're trying to catch as fast as we can. And from the last time I spoke to you, we've changed quite a bit. So, I've totally cut out the worms in my ground bait. You know, we were catching a few fish with worms, but you know what? maggots has been brilliant there's just a, a lack of roach at the minute so maggots is, has really been the bait and i'm just putting four red maggots on the hook and because i'm getting bites reasonably fast and because that lack of roach in in my swim i've lengthened my tail a little bit it's at 80 centimeters now which just means we can capitalise on those fish following the bait down and we can hopefully get a quick bite. There's another cracking fish. You can see the sun's out, we've, got the, we've had to put the shades on. I'm staring at my tip and the, 
The sun's dazzling now. Middle of the day. We're getting back. And the only thing I'm putting in my feeder now is a few pellets. We'll just put a few of those swim stim two mils in the feeder, obviously with our ground bait. And I think that just means that there's, there's less choice down there for the fish. And obviously when they rock up to that feeder, there's only my hook bait on show. Just dampening that, just a little area of ground, ground bait off, just so it's slightly damper. Almost like the consistency of putty really. So there's a tiny cloud that comes off that feeder as we as we cast it in. So we've got our feeder there, cut bait, four maggots, slightly longer tail. I mean, the last bite we had, it, it came literally within seconds of the, the feeder landing. So I mean, it'd be nice if we could repeat that. Not my best cast, probably a metre or so to the right of our main swim there, but hopefully it's good enough. It looks like I'm not going to get my tench that I really wanted, but as I've said, I'm more than happy catching catching bream. I mean, it's, it's brilliant to come out, out on a natural venue like this. Real nice, peaceful place. I love sitting in the water. I love getting the waders on. I love, you know, I, lo I love all of this sort of thing. And to catch some, to catch some bream in these sort of surroundings, it, it, it's fantastic. You know, this is, this is what I love about my fishing in the UK. This sort of fishing is fantastic to me. We've had an odd cormorant swim through the swim, which has quietened things down every now and again, but generally, once the fish have arrived, it's been pretty, pretty consistent. I think we're probably catching the fish today, probably that year class of fish that maybe aren't thinking about spawning. A lot of fish are thinking about spawning now and those fish are really right in the shallows. So we're probably catching that year class of fish that maybe aren't doing that. Like I say, some really big, I'd say the average, maybe six pound normally when you get on a shoal of bream in this lake, but I have to be content with those three pounders. Wow, what a brilliant day's feeder fishing. Sadly, no tench. I was really disappointed about that, but we've ended up catching one of these nearly every single chuck. Brilliant feeder fishing. Beautiful place to be as well. No doubt I'll be back. I'm desperate to catch one of those tench and maybe catch some of those bigger bream, but like I say, still a great day's fishing. Until next time, folks, tight lines.